Incorporated. And today we're talking all about Park Van Tassel and his uh, wonderful journeys from Albuquerque to the West and to the rest of the world. So of course, you're all very familiar with hot air ballooning in New Mexico and it's amazing, uh, amazing legacy, modern legacy of hot air ballooning uh, with Albuquerque being an international balloon capital. And I had the pleasure again of being out there a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago now for the fiesta. And you know, we all, the colors and the majesty of what's going on with hot air ballooning today is, is very, um, <laughs> very easy for us to understand. But there was a time not long ago when ballooning itself uh, was almost an impossible art. And if I just take time to go back through a brief history, it's not that long ago, 1783, that the first hot air balloon flight by man was made in France. And it took 10 years then for that to come to America on the East Coast with uh, Jean-Pierre Blanchard, a Frenchman, making the first balloon flight in America for George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Ben Franklin in the audience and others. Uh, it, again, uh, the development of the parachute, for instance, people taking a balloon up and then jumping out of the balloon with a parachute, that didn't happen until 1797 in France. And it took another you know, 10 years, 20 years to get to America with the first parachute jump being uh, by Neil in New York. Um, balloons were used for exhibitions, for in enjoyment and entertainment, and also reconnaissance in the Civil War. But mm -hmm. it took a long time for balloons to get to the West. Uh, through the gold rush, uh, the first balloon flight in Western America was by a young 16-year-old uh, boy, Joseph Gates, who made the first flight in 1853 at Oakland, California. Uh, the person that was supposed to be making that balloon flight was too heavy for the balloon. They uh, enticed this young boy to go up instead. Very brave boy made the flight and survived. Uh, so that's the first balloon flight. Uh, so I take you back to this time because there was this time not long ago when ballooning was this impossible thing. You'd never ever seen anyone gone up in the air before. It was a, a magical thing and people would pay money to come see just the majesty of someone going up in a balloon. Now we have the enjoyment of seeing 400 or 500 balloons at the International Balloon Fiesta. But in that same year, 1853, that that first flight was made in Oakland, Park Van Tassel was born in Indiana, and he encountered balloons as a child, being very engaged, interested in this concept of, of flight. Uh, he married a, a young woman, Elizabeth Spencer, in Indiana. They had one son that we're aware of, but that marriage didn't last long. And uh, I encourage you to keep track with me on the number of wives he has as he goes through this journey. Mm -hmm. uh, in, 1970, in 1879, he moves to California, to Stockton, uh, in, in the Central Valley. He marries another woman, Ella Block, in San Joaquin, and they have a son named Harry, but it's not clear what became of him uh, over time. But what is clear is uh, Van Tassel still has this interest in ballooning, and he acquires a very large gas balloon from a gentleman named F.F. F. Martin, who was a balloon aficionado in San Francisco in the 1860s through 1870s. And Van Tassel gets the balloon and a little bit of instruction on how to use it, tries to make two flights one at Stockton, one at Sacramento. Both of these flights don't work. You can't get it to go aloft uh, despite getting everything set. It just won't work. And newspaper reports report it as a big fizzle. He and his wife, Ella, decide to move to Albuquerque in July of 1881. Uh, this is about the same time as the OK Corral in Tombstone, and just to put things in perspective. And he becomes the operator of the Elite Tavern at the Opera House in Newtown, which is now downtown Albuquerque uh, at the northwest corner of 2nd Street and Railroad Avenue. He adopts this Van Tassel with two L's in the spelling as his name for his own marketing. His real name only had one L, uh, but so many people were misspelling it that he decided to use it as two L's. And as a either just out of interest or, or still maintaining this curiosity in ballooning, he ships the balloon from San Francisco to Albuquerque uh, to try ballooning again. And this is what Albuquerque looked like back in 1882. Uh, you know, we're still in the old West times. Um, and he decides then on July 4th, 1882, to make a flight uh, for the citizens of Albuquerque. This is again, Second Street between Railroad and Gold Avenues in Newtown. Uh, that required coal gas inflation. So at the time, uh, Albuquerque had just received illuminating gas to help with, uh, with lighting of the city. In order to make that gas, they would burn coal in a special environment that would produce enough gas that would be used for the illumination. But in this particular event, on July 2nd, they start taking all of the city's gas, putting it towards this one balloon in town. Everyone agrees that they're gonna go without gas for two days. And they take and fill this balloon up with as much gas as possible. 
And here we are on July 4th and the balloon's only two thirds full, but Van Tassel's promised to go and make this balloon ascension. So as the day is getting long, he's like, okay, it's time to go. And at seven, at 6.15, he decides to launch. He goes up to 14,000 feet as measured by his barometer and comes back down with a safe landing near Old Town. Uh, not only is that Van Tassel's first successful flight in a balloon ever, but it's the first successful flight by anyone in the New Mexico territory. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the only picture we have of that balloon event, yeah. uh, what it was looking like at the time, trying to get this gas bag uh, with a netting over it. And it's a complicated thing to get this to work, uh, but this, this worked. And through some very careful work of uh, detective work by my friends, Dick Brown and Rick Van Tassel, a indirect descendant of Park Van Tassel, we've pieced together the location of this precise launch uh, the photographer for this, for this picture that I just showed you was standing right here. This was the Cromwell building that's photographed in the, in the photo behind the balloon. And the launch site was this building that was here, now a parking lot uh, in downtown Albuquerque. So we know precisely where this happened. He has success. He's hailed as a hero. The big saloon has a big party for him, the first flight ever. He tries to go to Las Vegas, New Mexico to make another flight. Uh, he's hired by them to go make this flight for the town. But strong winds damage the balloon. And on another attempt, he just can't get enough gas to have enough inflating power to get this balloon off the ground. Even with a lighter pilot, you know, coaxing someone else to try to go in the basket, he still can't make it go. He returns to Albuquerque in September to try to make another balloon ascension for the state territorial fair. Uh, but as they're trying to handle the balloon, the balloon escapes the handlers, the ropes, and it goes up without anyone on board. Mm -hmm. uh, again, a terrible, you know, terrible <laughs> situation. Now this is his fifth attempt or sixth attempt. He's only had one success, and people in New Mexico are wondering, you know, is he is, does he really know what he's doing? Is he a fraud? What 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 is this? Uh, how can he not have it happen again? So unfortunately, at this time, he ends up leaving New Mexico. Um, he sells his saloon. His wife Ella leaves for California, while Park leaves for Utah. And it's not clear if there was a split there between the uh, as a married couple or what was driving this, but they left. And Park moves on and makes another ascension at, at Salt Lake City on July 4th of 1883, another Independence Day celebration with a fantastic flight at Washington Square. We're near this building that's pictured here that still exists in Salt Lake City with a monkey as his passenger. His first passenger was a monkey. They go up to 15,000 feet together and he comes back down and makes a successful landing. And that is billed as the first successful gas balloon ascension in all of Utah. So now he's made the first flight in New Mexico. He also makes the first flight in Utah. He goes up again later in July with Mrs. Fanny Hoyt and makes a wonderful six and a half hour balloon flight over the Wasatch Range, beautiful landing. He's finally getting the hang of ballooning. But what made the papers was that this married man, Park Van Tassel had gone up in a balloon with someone else's wife Fanny Hoyt, wow, that was news, uh, you know, a big scandal. Uh, so after this, he leaves Salt Lake City for San Francisco, goes to San Francisco and then rather immediately decides to go on another tour, going to Oregon, making the first balloon flight at Portland, uh, and then also making other successful ascensions in Oregon through September of 1883, finally making another great ascension at Salem at the State Fair in Oregon, 9,000 feet up, covering five miles and 50 minutes. So really kind of getting the hang of ballooning and starting now to figure out he could take this on an exhibition, realizing that for every city he goes to, they're gonna pay him to be there. And also citizens come to see this balloon flight, they'll pay five cents to be closer into the enclosure where this balloon is being erected and then, and then assembled and then launched. Um, realizing of course also you could stay outside of the enclosure and still see a balloon go up, it's in the air, you're gonna see it. Um, but if you wanna be a part of the action, you pay your nickel comes back, does some successful ascensions in San Francisco, Stockton, and LA, but then constructs a very large new balloon called the Eclipse. This is 50, 58 feet in diameter, 110 feet tall, and test flies that at a baseball park called Central Park in downtown San Francisco uh, at 8th and Market in November. This test flight was its own um, amazing journey. Uh, they launched with two other passengers on board. It's such a large balloon, it can handle three people. But the winds in the Bay Area were such that in San Francisco it was a westerly wind and in Oakland it was an easterly wind. And this balloon gets kind of trapped out over the bay. And they meander around the bay trying to find a way to get back to land, but uh, there's, no, there's no way to land on land. So they end up landing in the water having taken most of their clothes off to try to get the balloon to still stay up as long as possible. So the extra weight, they're trying to get the weight off the balloon. And he lands in the water, they get rescued. 
But now with this big balloon, Park Van Tassel is conceptualizing very, very long cross-country journeys. He, he says to the media, I'm gonna make a flight over the Sierra Nevada from, from San Francisco. And at the time that was science fiction. The newspaper reporters were like, wow, this is crazy talk. And it makes national news that Park Van Tassel makes, wants to make a flight like this. But right away uh, in 1885, in March, March of 1885, Van Tassel's hired to give a balloon exhibition at the New Orleans uh, um, World's Fair. And this is, again, he's now gaining such notoriety as a, a national expert on ballooning, Professor Van Tassel, that they hire him to do this. He goes all the way from California to New Orleans. He makes a, a partial inflation because, again, it's just so hard to get the gas required to get the balloon inflated in time. Uh, so that only allows him to get up to about 4,000 feet. And in New Orleans, the river makes a the Mississippi River makes a, a large bend. He lands on the west side of the Mississippi in a swamp and trying to get out of the balloon, the balloon escapes his, his release and keeps going, bounds on without him, across the Mississippi to the other side of the Mississippi. And he has to then figure out how to recover the, the balloon and bring it back, he does eventually, and uh, you know, re repairs the balloon. But this event creates considerable national press for, for Van Tassel. He's now one of the experts of ballooning in America. He returns to California as a part of this and rather immediately divorces Ella and marries another woman, Clara Korkendahl. And Clara comes from a very high society family in San Jose. The parents of Clara's parents were not at all pleased that Clara was marrying this gallivanting aeronaut uh, who would just do ballooning for his life. Uh, and they didn't approve of the marriage. They didn't attend the wedding. They didn't want any part of this. Uh, but Clara was all, all gangbusters to be with Park Van Tassel. So uh, as a part of this wedding, Park envisions now, I could have tethered balloons and take couples that are getting married aloft in the balloon. Like if I find a pastor that's willing to go up with them, they could do their wedding vows in the air. That'd be kind of a neat gimmick. It's hard to find pastors that are willing to go up in the air. So many of those ceremonies were performed on the ground. He makes another tour of the West. He goes to Los Angeles again, July 4th of 1886 now making a great one hour flight with two passengers over, over LA. Again, now proposing not only flights across mountain ranges, but flights across all of North America in these balloons. He wants to really get on the map. He's got a balloon that's capable of serious distance, uh, but that makes international news just for the mere proposition of, of making such long flights. He travels to Denver uh, in August of 1886, making a short flight of only a few hundred feet. It's so difficult in the high altitude of Denver along with the the issues with gas inflation to make such a, a flight. But he's credited by some as having the first balloon flight in, Col in Colorado. Uh, he travels on to Kansas City and at Kansas City, he makes a great ascension also in August of 1886. But the crowd is so large that only a very small percentage, 10% of the crowd is willing to pay the five cents to get inside the enclosure to make his money. He goes to a policeman and says, can you please help bring more people into the enclosure? And the policeman's like, that's not my job. They get into an altercation and ends up, Park Van Tassel ends up being arrested uh, and then has to figure out how to get out of jail to make his flight. That's another story. But he does make a fine ascension in Kansas City and leaves Kansas City to come back. He comes back to San Francisco with a new idea. He, he, realizing now he is just making uh, his life, his career is going from city to city doing balloon exhibitions for paying customers. How do I my, up my game to make people want to pay 10 cents instead of five cents? What's some kind of new attraction I could add? And he comes up with the idea of adding parachute jumping. It's likely that Park didn't know about previous parachute jumps in France and uh, on the East Coast. So he's ra ra uh, rather thinking about these things independently. Um, but he starts designing a parachute. When he returns to San Francisco, at the same time, there was a gentleman named Thomas Baldwin who was a tightrope walker uh, if you're familiar with the, the Cliff House, it's a very famous location on the west side of San Francisco. There was a tightrope that went from the, the Cliff House out to Seal Rock. And Thomas Baldwin would do these uh, activities for, for, for paying, and paying people to watch him do this. It was a crazy thing to do, but he did it successfully. Thomas Baldwin hears of Van Tassel's idea about doing parachutes and thinks that's a good way of making money. So they team up together uh, to develop these parachutes and um, figure out how to do this. There's a large building in downtown San Francisco called the Mechanics Pavilion, very tall, uh, multi-story building, where they started working out the parachute, how to drop it with weights to make it open, how do you get this to work, the mechanics of parachuting. And their parachute they, they invent 
It's a flexible parachute with a hole at the top that allows the air to escape so that the parachute won't waffle on the way down. They both make parachute jumps inside the building to test this uh, from the rafters. And then once they've got a parachute that they think works, of course, now they have to really test it. So they take a balloon, uh, they go up to 3,000 feet, they harness a dog with the parachute, they take the dog and put the dog out the side of the basket and see if the dog's going to survive. Sure enough, the dog survives without any harm, of course, maybe traumatized. Um, but after that event, they say, okay, we've got a balloon that works, the dog drops safely. Who's going to be first? Is it you, Van Tassel, or is it me, Baldwin? And Baldwin was surely the more courageous, courageous of the two, had already had this, this ability to do exhibitions on tight ropes. And so Baldwin rather immediately goes to a local trolley company and offers the suggestion of the trolley company paying a dollar for every foot that Baldwin goes up in the air and then jumps from. Uh, why a trolley company? Because they're gonna do this event at the, ter at the terminus of a trolley stop and everyone in town is gonna to wanna to take the trolley to go to watch this happen. So the trolley company is gonna make money, Baldwin and Ben Tassel are gonna make money. It's the win-win. The trolley company offers $1,000 for a thousand foot jump. Back in 1887, that's $30,000 today, a lot of money. And I'm not sure I would even jump out of a balloon with a parachute for 30 grand today, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of money. They make arrangements to do this with Van Tassel's tethered eclipse balloon. And um, Baldwin ends up being the first one to do this. And this first successful parachute jump in January of 1887 is the first jump by anyone with a parachute in the Western America. Again, likely the first parachute jump in the US since Giel's 19, 1819 uh, jump. This is the only two photos we have of that event uh, that we're aware of. This is from the San Francisco History Center. And on the left, you can see the Baldwin standing on the side of the basket with a parachute connected to the balloon here. It's connected by a small hook that's going to break loose with the weight of Baldwin when he jumps out. And on the right, you can see that the balloon has ascended quite a lot because of Baldwin's weight no longer being associated with the balloon. And Baldwin falling here in the parachute that's opened up. You can barely make out Baldwin in the photo. Again, very rare photos of this event. At, these, at, at this ascension and this parachute jump, uh, the two were assisted by another gentleman, William Ivy, who uh, took on the moniker of Ivy Baldwin, uh, one of Baldwin's brothers, although he wasn't related. Um, rather, rather quickly after the correct, after this amazing ascension and, and parachute jump in San Francisco, uh, Baldwin and William Ivy travel to William to uh, to Quincy, Illinois. They make another parachute jump in Quincy. They travel to New York, make a jump. They travel to London and start making parachute jumps from balloons all over England. Uh, for lots and lots and lots of money and huge, huge crowds. Uh, this leaves Van Tassel wondering what happened to my exhibitionist friend uh, who's just sk skipped town with this great idea and how am I now, am I supposed to be making these jumps? I'm not so sure I want to, or do I go back to generating income by some other less terrifying approach? Van Tassel, sorry, I should mention that Baldwin, as a part of his being in England, patents the parachute uh, with another gentleman, Farini, who has no background in aeronautics. Uh, he has a background in patenting. And the description of the picture you're seeing here is precisely the same parachute that he and Van Tassel invented. There's no record of Van Tassel ever getting credit for this or getting any monetary compensation for this. It was Baldwin doing this on his own uh, in England. So Van Tassel's then uh, connected to a, a newspaper. The San Francisco Examiner asks Van Tassel to take aloft a photographer. People had now seen balloons go up with people on board, but very few had seen what the city looks like from the air, taking a picture from the air and getting that visualization. So they take some of the first aerial photos of California from Van Tassel's balloons in 1887. They repeat this for the Los Angeles Examiner later in June of 1887, the first aerial photos of LA. And these photos in these specific newspapers really helped galvanize the career of a very young editor, William Randolph Hearst, who was the one who was the brainchild of these ideas of taking photos from the air at age 24, very young, uh, very start of his career. This is one of those photos that still exists uh, over Los Angeles. You can see LA Plaza and West 2nd Street with the LA River in the background. Um, again, things have changed as they do over time and the city's far bigger now. Um, they continue on, they come back to San Jose uh, Park's scheduled to make a parachute jump, but there's some kind of accident that happens during the launch and there's no jump. Whether that's a true accident or it's just Van Tassel's nerves, you know, do I really want to be doing this or not? It's not clear. He makes a new balloon, the National, in 1888, makes one trip here to San Diego, making a successful flight across San Diego Bay 
in a balloon, no jump, just a, just a balloon flight. His wife, Clara, uh, decides that it's time for someone to be making a parachute jump. And the person who's gonna be making that jump is Clara. Uh, they have a, a discussion. Clara says, you know, Park, if you're not willing to do it, I am, let's go do this. And at the time in 1888, there weren't women doing this. This was a new thing, um, just not something that women did. And at, at the time of women's rights and the women's rights movement, this was another mark for women to try to achieve something that only men were doing. So they, on July 4th, yet again, July 4th, 1888 in Los Angeles, they make, uh, they make it public that they're gonna be doing this, that Clara is the one going up and doing the parachute jump. And now there are people in Los Angeles that don't think this is something women should be doing they don't think that it's certainly something that, you know, if the woman's gonna go try to commit suicide on July 4th, we gotta stop this. So they send the police, they get the police to come out to try to stop this event from happening. Word gets back to the Van Tassels that the police are coming. So they, they move the launch up from two o'clock in the afternoon to 1040, 1047. Let's all go before the police can get here. And they go up to 5,000 feet over Pasadena and uh, Clara jumps out, uh, much, much to Park's near a heart attack. And she survives the fall, uh, makes the first parachute jump by a woman in Western America. The fact that Clara, a woman, was able to do that uh, with such bravado, not only made national news, it made international news for the next six months. It made news back in England. I'm sure Thomas Baldwin heard about it. it makes news in Australia and in India. Everywhere around the world hears about Clara Van Tassel. Uh, and again, a very brave woman. They try to make another repeated jump for Clara in San Jose in, in August, her hometown. But there's all sorts of problems with the balloon ascension, getting the balloon ready, getting the parachute hooked up. People have already paid. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Do I have to repay the customers that have already paid? There's a huge melee that happens. And both the Van Tassels are just very happy to escape, <laughs> escape that scenario with their lives. It was really quite a crazy melee. Uh, but after all these events, Park Van Tassel is pleased that Clara had survived but not please, it was just so so difficult for Park to go through that, <laughs> that he didn't want Clara doing that anymore. And so Park continues on to the Northeast, North, sorry, Northwest, to Portland and to Seattle, offering to make parachute jumps. His first attempt in Portland, again, has an accident with no jump. But finally in Seattle, he finally makes his first parachute jump. It's a harrowing experience. He jumps out of the balloon with his parachute. The parachute fails to open for the first 500 feet of his journey. <laughs> and then all of a sudden opens with such, such strength that he almost loses his grip on this iron bar he's hanging onto, the, the iron ring to, to, to hang onto the parachute. And the reporters are, the, I thought that that was the most fabulous moment of the whole adventure that he almost lost his grip and almost, fit, and almost died as a part of this event. He lands safely though at the water, uh, in the water in the Pacific Ocean, just at the foot of Denny Way and is rescued from Seattle. He makes a second jump at San Francisco in front of 10,000 spectators. But again, the parachute fails to open quickly and Park Van Tassel realizes that maybe this parachute thing really just isn't worth his life. Uh, this is one of the kinds of scenes that were at the Cliff House. We're not sure that this is exactly Park's balloon jump, but you get the sense of this kind of awe-inspiring moment for a lot of people. He's hired to make a balloon jump and a parachute jump at Salt Lake City in 1889 for a lot of money. You can see the advertisement here, the great Van Tassel, who's been hired, who's been engaged at great expense. Even in the advertising, they're saying how much money it was going to take. Um, he travels all the way to Salt Lake City and realizes that he's brought the wrong balloon. He's brought his wife's balloon, which was smaller. And the balloon he's brought is not capable of carrying Park Van Tassel aloft. He also arrives and finds that there's competitors now. There's this guy, James, Van, James Price and uh, Lady Millie Viola that are making parachutes in Salt Lake City already. They, you know, it's, it's crazy. Uh, so how is he gonna do this? He has to find someone that's gonna go up and masquerade as being Park Van Tassel or else, you know, it, it's a fraud. He finds a gentleman, Dudley Cochran, who's never been in a balloon before and never made a parachute jump before in his life. And he offers him 400 bucks to go up in this, par in this balloon and jump out of the clouds and he does. So Dudley Crocker goes up all the way up past the clouds, jumps out of the balloon, comes back through the clouds with a parachute, lands in Salt Lake, gets rescued out of Salt Lake. Van Tassel pays him the 400 bucks. Everyone thinks it was Park Van Tassel, except it was Dudley Crocker. And later on, Dudley owns up to doing this several years later in a newspaper in Nebraska that I had to find. It was a lot of fun to try to find and realize that this is what had happened. But everyone at the time thought it was Park. He then continues and he comes back to Albuquerque, back to New Mexico. And on July 4th, again, 1889, he tries to make a balloon ascension with a parachute jump with a new friend, Joe Lawrence. 
who is now masquerading as one of Park Van Tassel's brothers, Joe Van Tassel, uh, with Joe being the one that's going to do the parachuting. They have a difficulty and it doesn't work. And yet again, Albuquerque is wondering, you know, is Park really know what he's doing or is he a fraud? What's happening here? They leave Albuquerque again. Uh, but on the way back to San Francisco, at different locations, they practice. They make balloon jumps and uh, balloon ascensions and parachute jumps at Santa Monica, Los Angeles, Fresno, and Visalia. By the time they get back to San Francisco, Joe Lawrence has kind of figured out how to get this to work. And they've realized now that there are competitors in the American West doing the same kind of gig. Why don't we take this idea nationally or internationally and go on a bigger tour of the world? Meanwhile, Thomas Baldwin has come back to America to continue making these kinds of exhibitions. He comes to Albuquerque in September for the State Fair. He makes uh, two uh, attempts, both failures, finally makes a, a successful balloon ascension uh, at, at Albuquerque. So now you've had the great Van Tassel and the great Baldwin uh, both making uh, their ascensions at Albuquerque. So now that they've come to San Francisco, again, traveling all of the American West by rail, think of the expense and the time having to go city to city to get enough money to go to the next city. It's its own uh, very difficult issue. Uh, now they're going to go by boat to the world. And the first stop on their boat tour uh, is Hawaii. They make two ascensions, one at Kapiloni Park near Diamond Head and another at Punchbowl near Pearl Harbor that I'll talk about. The first one, Joe Lawrence, again masquerading as Joe Van Tassel, uh, in November of 1889 makes a great uh, balloon ascension parachute jump at Kapiloni Park. It's a sensation, first successful parachute jump in Hawaii's history. But uh, they realize that it's King Kalakaua's birthday in a couple weeks. Why don't we repeat this for the king? Because the king wasn't able to see this fantastic event. Uh, and for those of you that have been to Hawaii, you realize that, of course, it's often that the trade winds are happening out of the northeast on Oahu. And the higher up you go, the stronger those winds get. And they, making this jump at Punchbowl, they offer Joe Lawrence to wear a life preserver just in case the winds push you out to sea, you'll, you'll have a, a way of thinking. He's like, no, I'm not gonna wear anything. This is for the king. I'm not gonna wear a life preserver for the king. I'm gonna make this jump. So sure enough, he launches with the balloon and the winds are strong and they start drifting him out over Honolulu. By the time he releases from the balloon, the trade winds are so strong it drifts both the balloon and the parachute out to sea off of Pearl Harbor. They both land in the ocean and Unfortunately, Joe Lawrence is never seen again. He drowns, he drowned in the, in the ocean. It's likely that the iron ring that he was either attached to or hanging on to sank rather quickly, uh, taking him with it. But as they were trying to rescue him and they're sending out the landing craft to go try to find, you know, where's Joe Lawrence and try to get this, get him back. There were sharks that were sighted in the water nearby Pearl Harbor. And of course, the combination of finding sharks and having this terrible event happen made it that maybe the sharks that ate Joe Lawrence as he was landing in the water. And the stories even got, you know, they were jumping out of the water to get him. They, the stories grew and grew and grew. And this became an international sensation that this poor parachute jumper had died in such a terrible, tragic way with sharks. It even made it to France, as you see here on the right. Um, it was also confusion. Was it Park Van Tassel that had died through this terrible tragedy or someone else? Uh, it was lots of confusion in the paper. This is the first time that one of the first events where Van, for Park Van Tassel is thought to have died uh, as a part of his experiments, but actually it was Joe. Uh, they never recovered Joe Lawrence. And now the question was, how do I continue with my tour given the, ex the, the parachute jumper that I just trained had perished in such a terrible, tragic way? But they do continue on. So Van Tassel and this manager of this tour, Frank Frost, continue on to Sydney, Australia. And there they meet up with Jane Price, the same Jim's Price that had been parachute jumping in Utah. Um, so clearly when they were at Salt Lake, they made an agreement to go do this kind of international tour and meet up in Sydney. And it was unfortunate that Joe Lawrence couldn't continue with them, but they continue on with scheduled exhibitions throughout Australia doing this balloon parachute uh, uh, act. They start first in Sydney. I'm not gonna go through all these journeys in detail but they go to Melbourne, uh, Ballarat, Bendigo, Adelaide, up to Brisbane and up the Gold Coast to Townsville and on to Southeast Asia, which I'll talk about. Um, they make the first jumps. These are some of the earliest parachute jumps in Australian history in Sydney. And now James Price is masquerading as yet another brother of Van Tassel, James Van Tassel. As a part of the act, it takes time to fill the balloon. Uh, these are now smoke balloons. These are not gas balloons, but smoke balloons that are uh, held aloft by poles 
over a hot furnace, uh, burning, uh, burning material, to get the hot air to rise into this balloon, typically also with smoke involved. And then you'd go up with this balloon. Once you jump from the balloon, the balloon's going to come back down on its own, and you come back down as a parachutist. Um, but it takes time to get these things set up. And while the amazingly large crowds, 100,000 people are jamming this area to try to watch what's happening, they started having trapeze artists do some acts ahead of the schedule. Two of these uh, trapeze artists were Americans living in Sydney by the name of the Frietas sisters. And the Frietas sisters decide not only to do the trapeze work, but they say, why don't we become part of the act? Why can't we do the parachute jumping? Wouldn't people pay more money to see women jump than men? So sure enough, very quickly in February of 1890, Valerie becomes the first a woman in Australia's history to make a parachute jump, masquerading as Valerie Van Tassel, yet another sister of the family, a growing, growing family of Van Tassels. And not to be outdone by her sister, Gladys makes another jump from Newcastle near Sydney, the second woman to make a jump in Australia. These girls now become amazing, huge news, national heroes, especially again during the women's movement of the late 1890s or of the 1890s. Um, a lot of his national heroes. And, uh, and, the, and now almost every city in Australia wants to see the Van Tassel sisters come and make a jump. They travel to Melbourne in front of 100,000 people, they're making jumps. All of a sudden, they're huge news. It's like rock stars. Uh, just think about the, the, the amazing bravado of these women, what they were doing. They would go up under this balloon with a little trapeze bar. Uh, you can see one of them situated here in a diagram. They would do trapeze work on the way up as the balloon is going up. Then they'd pull the lever and be released by, this, by, the, by the parachute and come back down again. Uh, again, huge heroes of Australia's aviation, really the first women to fly in Australia. There's only one photo we're aware of of these women. Uh, this is Gladys uh, from the State Library of Victoria that I was pleased to find. And even the photo itself was mislabeled as Gladys Van Tasso, yet another bastardization of the Van Tassel name. Uh, but clearly it was really Gladys Frietis. They continue on. I'm going to go quickly, but again, making their journey all the way to Adelaide. Uh, they make fabulous jumps. But as a part of the management of this tour now, Park Van Tassel and James Price have a falling out, and they decide to split, with James Price continuing on with Frank Frost and Millie Viola, who had traveled from Utah to come to Australia to continue on this journey, and Park Van Tassel continuing on to Queensland with Gladys and Valerie. So now you have two exhibitions going on in parallel. They immediately go to Brisbane. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, there's these big poles that are being used to erect the balloon to keep it over the fire to keep the hot air going into the balloon. It's a very difficult arrangement. And at Brisbane, at one of these events, unfortunately, one of these pole, poles falls during the inflation of the balloon and it hits a young boy and kills him on, on the spot. Uh, just a terrible tragedy. And that led to a, a court case was it an accident? Was it you know uh, malfeasance? What's going on here? And finally, they figure out that it was an accident. And if they just move the enclosure back and keep people away from the balloon as it's being inflated, that's a good safety precaution. So they continue with that for, throughout the, the rest of the tour, but it takes time to get through that decision. Uh, they continue on. They go to Townsville, which is up in the north part of, of Australia. And they make a jump on, on Sunday, uh, June 22nd, 1890. Uh, Sunday is an important day. So at, at the time this was happening, it, ha it happened that the Australian Defense Force was marching through town. Why not see this great exhibition that's happening, this balloon launch? It's kind of like today's SpaceX launch. We don't, you know, if it's happening, we're going we're gonna to be there and watch it. Um, but others were complaining. Why are we doing any kind of exhibitions like this on the day of rest? We're not supposed to be doing anything like this on the day of rest. And uh, there was also complaints because one of the majors in the Australian Defense Force, a married major, uh, married uh, Major DeVoe, uh, gave Gladys a bouquet of flowers before she launched. And he was married, she was not. And there was another big confusion in the, in the newspapers. Why would it be that a married, uh, married Major would give a bouquet to an unmarried woman who's going to be doing these exhibitions? Oh, my goodness. And so the, while they made these great flights, the papers were filled with this, this dialogue about, you know, we shouldn't be doing these things and the defense force shouldn't, on taxpayer money shouldn't be watching these things, they should be marching instead. It was a whole big thing. Anyway, they, they did dedicate a street in Townsville. It still exists today, Van Tassel Street, in honor of Gladys's flights uh, in Townsville. So they continue on, leaving Townsville to the north to Southeast Asia. They keep going. They go to Indonesia, to uh, Singapore, Shanghai, the Philippines, then to Burma. 
Uh, and again, I'm not going to go through all these flights in detail, but just to note to note that Gladys is the one that continues on with Park. Valerie takes a, a, hi a hiatus from all of this. And they continue on with Gladys making the first balloon ascension and parachute jump in Shanghai, probably the first woman to make a parachute jump in all of China. Uh, they continue on and continue on. Park Van Tassel has now been gallivanting around Australia and Southeast Asia with two women uh, for quite a long time, not really in touch with his wife back home in Oakland. And Clara is granted a divorce for desertion uh, because of Van Tassel's activities all around the rest of the world, not really being with Clara anymore. There goes wife number three. There were other competitors that were still doing these events, not just in America, but now nationally or internationally. Percival Spencer from the UK has been doing balloon flights in India. He makes parachute jumps for Emperor Meiji as a part of the Meiji restoration of Japan, trying to introduce Western technology to Japan in the 1890s. Thomas Baldwin and William Ivey continue making parachute jumps now in New Zealand and Hong Kong and Tokyo. And James Price and Millie Viola are still continuing their jumps in Australia and New Zealand. There are several others that are now competing. Who can get to the next biggest city first to do these parachute jumps to make the most money to then continue to the next city? It's a race. So Van Tassel and Gladys continue on. They go to India, all these locations with red dots they make parachute jumps at. There's probably many more that I was un unable to uncover as a part of the research. Valerie rejoins the troop uh, and she makes what's believed to be the first parachute jump by a woman in India's history in Hyderabad in 1891. However, at a location at Mysore, they go up in the balloon, uh, Valerie goes up in the balloon, the balloon bursts open at only like 40 feet and she falls down, uh, very fortunately not severely injuring herself, but given the techni technicalities and the difficulties of doing this, they decide, both girls decide it's just not for them anymore. And they end up marrying two very wealthy Indians. And that leaves Park Van Tassel yet again, wondering who's gonna be doing my parachute jumps and how do I continue making my living doing this tour? I still wanna be an aeronaut on these exhibitions. It's very much like P.T. Barnum or Buffalo Bill Cody, but now we're doing it internationally only with balloons. He travels to London from India and he arranges with the newspaper, the London Graphic to make a very highly publicized journey by balloon across all of India from Calcutta to Bombay. This is gonna require a whole new large balloon. And while that balloon is being constructed, he returns to India. Now there's different people in India already flying as if they were Van Tassel, Park Van Tassel, clearly not Van Tassel because he's in London at the time, but making their own flights to try to collect their own money off the Van Tassel name. One of these people launches in Calcutta, doesn't really know what they're doing, lands in the Ganges River and is taken downstream and almost drowns, has to get rescued. And so there's another near-death experience that's reported in the papers as Park Van Tassel having died, but it wasn't Park Van Tassel because he hadn't come back yet to, to, to India. He does eventually come back and he returns to Bombay in late 1891 with another new parachute jumper, a lady named Jeanette Rummery. Uh, she goes by Jenny, but of course she also goes by Jeanette Van Tassel, another part of the family. She's sometimes regarded as Park Van Tassel's wife, but clearly she was uh, of a different age and sometimes regarded as her, his daughter. Wasn't very clear in the papers which was which, but somehow a relation. They make many parachute jumps over India from late October to March of 1892, all over very successful jumps. And here's a picture of Jenny on the left and Park on the right, uh, looking very dapper in the studio at Calcutta. And in March of 1892, 18, they make a jump at Dhaka, which is now Bangladesh. And back then it was still part of India. And Jenny launches in a balloon from the Asan Manzil, a very large palace at Dhaka, which still exists. And it makes, she makes a wonderful uh, balloon ascension and a wonderful parachute jump. But on the way down, she ends up landing in a tree at a very, at a very large park, Ramna Park, which again, still exists in Dhaka. She's tried to be rescued with bamboo poles from this tree. And during the rescue, unfortunately, one of the bamboo poles breaks and she falls out of the tree, uh, considerable severe injuries out of the fall. And she ends up dying two days later from those injuries. Uh, she's buried in Dhaka. Uh, given Dhaka is now Bangladesh, uh, she is considered to be the first person to ever fly in Bangladesh's history. And unfortunately, of course, tragically, she died as a part of that flight. That again, here we go again, makes international news that someone had died of Van Tassel. Uh, but now we know it's a woman, but clearly the only women that were known internationally were Gladys and Valerie, so it had to be one of them, but that's wrong. 
And the you know, international news that someone had died in such a tragic way. Uh, lots of, you know, the media was not very correct back then. Uh, needs a lot of correction. But now Van Tassel's yet again left to wonder, how do I continue? I keep bringing people into this and either leave or they end up dying, which is terrible. He makes several trips between India and London. He makes his own parachute jumps in India to keep going. He marries yet again, another woman, Edith Ann Nolan, in November of 1892. But by 1894, he's off again, making another journey, uh, leaving India to go to Sri Lanka. He makes what is believed to be the first balloon flight, first flight any, by anyone in Sri Lanka, and the first parachute jump in Sri Lanka's history in 1894. So all the way from Albuquerque to making the first flight in Sri Lanka's history. And most people in Sri Lanka don't realize that, that he's even from Albuquerque, and most people in Albuquerque have never known that he had ballooned, first, it ballooned at all in Sri Lanka. From Sri Lanka, he continues on. He goes to Africa, to Zanzibar, then to South Africa, then up to Persia, into Europe and Russia. I'm not gonna go through the details, it's in this book, but uh, again, some fantastic flights uh, for the Shah of Iran. He gets, uh, he gets made to be a general in the army of Persia, given a sword for his wonderful mastery of the air. He returns to India in 1895, uh, again, living a successful life in India for five years until having a stroke in October of 1900. Uh, and at the time the world was going through a global depression, it was, increasingly difficult for him to make money as an aeronaut. And because of his stroke and the need for better health care, he returns to California. He returns, uh, unfortunately, without his wife, Edith Ann Nolan. So we have no record of a divorce, but it's likely they had one. He returns to a very, very different time in the Bay Area. So think about it now. When he left America in the 1890s, ballooning was still just very, very uh, nascent. It just happened. But he comes back and all of a sudden now people are experimenting with these, these dirigibles, these sausage-shaped balloons with propellers on the sides uh, that can be used to steer through the air. The, the propellers on these balloons are, are very poor. They're like taking a ceiling fan off the ceiling and putting them on the side of, the, of this dirigible, spinning them fast enough and hoping to get propulsion. Um, and there was a gentleman named August Grief who was experimenting with these in the Bay Area and wanted to try them as early as 1884, but really got going in, 18, in 1903 into 1904. He makes a dirigible called the California Eagle. And of course he hires who else but Thomas Baldwin to be his aeronaut. Thomas Baldwin, the, one of the leading authorities of, of being an aeronaut at the time. And through this experience, Baldwin learns all about dirigible design. He pilots the dirigible in San Francisco, uh, the California Eagle, properly around San Francisco, but then they have a falling out. And uh, he learns all about this design from Greece. But Thomas is a very shrewd man and wonders who in the Bay Area could know about aeronautics to make a better propeller. He finds a gentleman named John Montgomery, who was experimenting with gliders in the Bay Area um, at the time. And Baldwin goes to Montgomery and said, you know, I've been doing this a long time, jumping from balloons with parachutes. What if you took a balloon and, and hoisted your glider underneath the balloon and then released the glider from the balloon? People would pay a lot of money to see that. And they form a contract so that Baldwin's now doing the, the balloon work and Montgomery's doing the gliding work. And that's what they're going to go do. But at the same time, Baldwin says, hey, can you make better propellers for dirigibles? Because I'm really interested in that too. They set up a wind tunnel at the campus on, at Santa Clara College and start designing better propellers. And after they have a successful propeller design, Baldwin goes to Los Angeles, designs and starts building another dirigible called the California Arrow, takes that to Adora Park in East Bay of, of uh, the Bay Area, test flights it, it works, and then goes to St. Louis and wins the first prize, $100,000, for the best dirigible flight at the World's Fair. No credit to Montgomery, no credit to Greece for any of that, no monetary reward. I'm hearing some kind of interference in the background, so I wonder if people can mute, if that's possible. Um, thank you, or if Fred, you might mute people. Um, so Montgomery's left then wondering, Baldwin's left, what do I do? How do I make these experiments work? And he finds, you know, who's a balloonist in the Bay Area who knows about balloons who can help me? He teams up with Van Tassel to provide these balloon exhibitions and together they try to make balloon expositions with gliders in 1905 in the Bay Area. But then just as they're having success, uh, the great quake of 1906 occurs in San Francisco. Park was living at the time in East Oakland. And of course, after that terrible event, um, <laughs> everyone's just scraping to try to make money in some manner. 
he re-engages with this idea of, of, of taking balloons for wedding ascensions you know, uh, and, and aerial photography at the time. He tries to go to Salt Lake City to make it, uh, another parachute jump exhibition, but now there's so many competitors in the area that someone, some vandals, destroy his balloon with making slits in the balloon before, you know, the night before it's used. And he just decides that it's no longer part of his capabilities to be doing these kinds of trips anymore. It's not, it's not in it for him. And he's an older man now. He realizes that he's become sort of the elder statesman of ballooning in the Bay Area. He's traveled the world and not many people back then had traveled the world. It was, a, it was a, quite a big thing to have traveled the world. And he knows a lot about ballooning. He's got a lot of experience. He helps form two clubs, the Pacific Aero Club and the Oakland Aero Club, specifically designed to help people with recreational ballooning. It's no longer for money, it's for fun, because it is fun. He designs a very large balloon called the City of Oakland, a gas balloon, and makes several impressive flights in the Bay Area with that, first starting on August 14th with another friend, Vander Nealen. And these are, I'll show you some, some pictures of this coming up. These are flights from right downtown Oakland. The first flight on August 19th is quite crazy because they get out of the Bay Area towards Pleasanton to the east, and there's tremendous wind in Pleasanton. They have no choice but to land in 40 knots of wind, which is for a balloonist way too much land to be landing in, but they land anyway. They get dragged along the ground. They both get injured, but not, not, uh, not terribly, and they're lucky to survive that landing. Here's a, a picture of that, that launch on August 14th uh, of 1909. You can see the crowd in Oakland. Uh, near the rail yard, uh, ready for this balloon to go up, a uh, very large gas balloon. And on the launch, they barely cleared the steeples of the church nearby. There's always some kind of harrowing event, uh, you know, as they're making these, these, uh, these launches. He also helps pioneer balloon races. Um, there weren't many balloon races at the time, but there were enough balloonists now in these two clubs to start having balloon races to see who could go the furthest or the furthest the fastest. These adventures have, again, harrowing uh, landings, uh, landings in the bay, getting drugged through the swamps near the sides of the San Francisco Bay, uh, just amazing adventures. He also is contacted by the Goodyear Rubber Company to advertise Goodyear on the tops of buildings in San Francisco with dirigible shaped advertising balloons. And these actually are the first Goodyear blimps, if you will, but they were shaped like blimps, not yet free flying, but Van Tassel was the first to help do that. Later on, they started making the pony blimp uh, and then Goodyear advertising on the side of the blimp. But Goodyear's first exhibitions were with Van Tassel. He ends up marrying again a woman named A.F. Barr. We're not sure of her first name uh, in 1912. Uh, and not much is known about A.F. Barr. We've looked very hard. And then, of course, you know, here we are today on Zoom uh, in the hopefully end of a pandemic. Back then, there was a pandemic to the influenza pandemic of 18, 1918. Uh, and Van Tassel's pretty much staying at home. Uh, he invents a mechanical toy, a slingshot parachute jumper that you can launch as a kid and have the parachute come back down again. This is filed in 1919 and, and patented in 1921. Probably not a lot of income, but a lot of fun. And in his ending years, uh, he ends up being the caretaker for a large estate at Glen Arbor near Santa Cruz, California on the Bay. Uh, and in 1930, he moves back to Oakland to live with his sister. And unfortunately, in October of that year, uh, he passes from a heart attack at Minnie's house in Oakland. His, his passing makes national news. Uh, people recognized him for being this expert balloonist of his time. Uh, but of course, as it was this whole, his whole life, they somehow got something wrong. They either called him Parks Van Tassel, at least they got the one L correct, or they said that he had first parachute jumped in Kansas City, which was not true, it was actually Seattle. Something was always wrong in the way he was remembered. Um, because he was moving so quickly through his life, it was really hard to know what he had done as, as, a, as a newspaperman. So to summarize, um, you know, he had this amazing first flight in New Mexico and had his last flights in, in, in Oakland. And in between lived not only this transition of adding greater things to exhibitions, whether it be parachutes or the addition of having women do these things, but uh, watch this transition happen in human flight from the mere possibility of in lighter than air balloons to dirigibles to then heavier than air aircraft to then you know, powered heavier than air aircraft to then realizing that balloons were fun simply for recreation. And that itself was its own amazing journey. So what an amazing time to live during that and having lived as a, the life of an aerial exhibitionist. It was very, very difficult to piece together this life. 
Uh, I was very fortunate to have the help of Dick Brown, who I think might be on the call, a Hall of Fame balloonist uh, in New Mexico, one that's helped start the International Balloon Fiesta, and also Rick Van Tassel, an indirect descendant of Park Van Tassel. Both Dick and Rick had collected PDFs of newspaper articles over this time. Think of them as little jigsaw puzzle pieces where we had, let's say, 200 pieces for a puzzle that was actually a thousand piece puzzle. And every time you look at one of these pieces and you put, I say, oh, this is this event in Albuquerque and he goes to Las Vegas next and you put those together, you have to then say, where is he going next and get the next puzzle piece and try to figure that out. And it took a lot of time and effort through a lot of uh, newspaper articles mainly to go piece together this story as followed his trail. But people in those towns would write about him when he was there and then not write about him ever again. So he'd disappear. It's also amazing to realize, especially for New Mexico's history, that just 30 years after Van Tassel's passing, Colonel Joseph Kittinger launched in a balloon, went up to almost the edge of space, 100,000 feet up, and jumped with a parachute to come back down safely to Earth uh, over in New Mexico. So just 30 years, we went from you know, doing recreational flights from Van Tassel to actually going to space to come back down over New Mexico. And Dick Brown famously has said that Van Tassel took ballooning to the world, and of course, now the world of ballooning comes back to Albuquerque, where he all started. So it's really a fantastic journey from Albuquerque to all the different places he went. And through this research, I've realized that, of course, um, it is unfortunate that Van Tassel passed away during the Great Depression. His family didn't have enough money uh, to bury him with a marker. So he's buried in a grave in a cemetery in Oakland, the Evergreen Cemetery. Uh, which famously was a cemetery for people that did not have a lot of money. So there's a lot of unmarked graves in that cemetery. We have now discovered where he is in that cemetery. And uh, I think it's very deserving for him to have a marker placed there at his grave for all the things he's done, not just for Oakland, but for Sri Lanka and for Albuquerque and for, uh, for women and for all the things he did during his life. It's also the case that the location of his first flight in Albuquerque and in New Mexico is also deserving of a, a marker, a state marker that says this is the first flight in, in, in New Mexico state's history. That site is now a parking lot in downtown Albuquerque. I had the pleasure of visiting the parking lot when I was there three weeks ago or so just to see where it was to say I'd been there. Um, but that's really, there should be some marker that says this is where flights started in New Mexico. And then of course, you know, all these deserving women that had the bravado to pair up with Van Tassel, either as an exhibitionist or as a wife, uh, deserve, their own, they deserve their own recognition for what they did for women's rights during this amazing time. So in order to raise money and awareness for this, I've set up a GoFundMe to start raising money to do this. I think it's up to $750 or $800 now to get going towards the goal um, of at least getting the marker set up in Oakland. Uh, I've, I had the good fortune of giving this lecture just yesterday to the Oakland History Center uh, there was a lot of interest in, in this marker there at Oakland. I hope that there's also interest through New Mexico, through your, your group or for other groups to help me figure out how to do the logistics of getting a marker placed at, 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 uh, at the parking lot in Albuquerque. Um, we also know, and I just, you know, since you're all historians, get you on alert, we know for sure that he returned from his travels in India and throughout the world with a large scrapbook of photos and newspaper clippings of all of his journeys. Uh, that newspaper scrapbook was almost its own topic of discussion with the media at the time because so few people had traveled. It was just of interest to look through the scrapbook and see places and see Persia, what it's like. But of course, that scrapbook has unfortunately been lost to time. And so if you ever see a scrapbook of lots of ballooning photos and Van Tassel stuff that either belongs at the International Balloon Museum in Albuquerque or at the Oakland History Center, something that's going to protect it, preserve it so that other historians can, can, uh, can use it for the future. So I had the pleasure of writing this book uh, and also the very first press I went to go out to to go see if they were interested with the, was the University of New Mexico press. To me, it has to be a New Mexico story. I was so pleased that they took it on and they've done a fabulous job of getting it out and marketing it and helping me get this word out about Van Tassel. It also includes a glossary of ballooning terms. I had a pleasure as a high school student in my summers uh, working a summer job as a balloon chase person. I had to go help chase the balloon and bring it down here in San Diego. But I, uh, that's my, that was my total history in ballooning uh, before I started on this journey writing this book. So I've learned a lot of terms and I include them in the book for you to learn too uh, with lots of notes. It's also available by Amazon. And just to summarize, lots and lots of people help with the research that went through this. I connected with lots of organizations around the world. Uh, to find newspapers that I could then go research and help uh, search for this, this, this jigsaw puzzle tour. Uh, in the US, you know, again, lots of folks 
uh, throughout China and Japan, uh, people folks, I had a, a whole uh, university set of students helping me translate articles from Japanese and Chinese into English so that I could understand what was happening. Um, so again, and just finally, uh, the good folks at the University of New Mexico Press, uh, my family, uh, the folks at the International Balloon Museum who are fabulous and now have not only helped preserve Van Tassel, but also have an exhibit at the Sunport uh, on early ballooning, including a special exhibit on Van Tassel for all the people to see when they come through the airport there. And that just came online before the, the uh, balloon fiesta, which was fabulous. I, lo I loved getting off the plane and seeing a whole Van Tassel exhibit. That was amazing. And then uh, truly this would not have been possible without Dick Brown and Rick Van Tassel's assistance as we went through this process. So with that, happy to, uh, to <laughs> take any questions and I thank you for your time and interest. I'm, I'm definitely very eager if you can help me put me in the right direction to towards getting that marker um, placed. I, I know a little bit about doing that here in California. I had the pleasure of preserving a glider port here in San Diego, a historic glider port at a city, state, and national register of historic places level and have worked to get um, markers placed on that here in California, but I do not know the process of doing that in New Mexico and the Historical Resources Board. If someone can help point me to that direction and work with me on that, that would be absolutely fabulous. Gary, thank you very much. This was a fascinating discussion. And I, I've got a couple of questions and Please. I suspect other people have as well. Yeah. Um, the first question, back, back on some of your, uh, your earlier uh, slides, you mentioned that um, the uh, envelopes were was filled with, with coal gas. How, yeah. how, how was that developed or yeah. introduced? Uh, so, so coal gas was used at the time to develop the illuminating gas that was used to light, um, to light the, the houses and things. Um, and as I understand, and maybe if Dick's on the line, I don't know if Dick is or not, uh, he might be able to comment, but my understanding is they would burn coal gas. They would burn coal in an anoxic environment and the, the gas that would come off of that would be uh, a lifting gas. It's not as lifting as hydrogen would be that we would use today for a gas balloon, but it still had lifting capabilities. And so they would capture that in tubing and then route the tubing to this big gas bag and inflate the gas bag with the, with the so the more gas you burn, the more coal you burn, the more gas you produce. But the, all of that takes a lot of time. Uh, uh -huh. And it was far easier and far faster to just set up a bonfire uh, light the bonfire, put the balloon over the over the bonfire, hopefully not uh, set the balloon on fire, having these poles holding it out there to collect the, the hot air and do hot air smoke balloons. And so at the time people were starting, uh, if they wanted to do long journeys, they would use gas balloons. If they wanted to do short hops and then jump from the balloon, they were typically doing smoke balloons. Interesting, interesting. If uh, <clears throat> Does anyone else have some questions? And I'll stop sharing so it's easier for us to see each other. There you are. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Happy to answer any questions. I am curious in the audience, I know that many of you may have heard of Van Tassel's name or, or recognized uh, his name in some regard or what he did in New Mexico. I am just curious if anyone had heard of any of the other things he's done, especially internationally. Uh, were, were you aware of the India connection or the Sri Lanka co connection? Okay, and so I, I see some uh, no's. <laughs> uh, so I, I again think that's another part of this history that needs to be highlighted in New Mexico because it was because of his efforts in New Mexico that he ended up doing all this stuff. Had he not been successful there, it's not known if he'd ever made it to Sri Lanka. And I really think that's a New Mexico story. It's also an Oakland story because of what he did in Oakland for helping with recreational ballooning. And so those two this, these two cities really need to figure out the story. And, and I do hope that the book ends up galvanizing more interest in his story. I think there'll be a lot of interest in it, especially in the, in, in the Albuquerque area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, one other question I had was, w were these balloons um, cloth or silk or yeah, what, great, what was the fabrication? For great, of great that? question, great question, Fred. And I'm often asked that question. My understanding is that the first balloon he used in Albuquerque was actually made out of cow intestines. And these were uh, these very stretchy material, very hard to get but you get it in great quantities uh, and it's not that expensive. Putting together and strapping together cow intestines, don't ask me how they did that. I have no understanding of how that's done, wow. uh, but, but that's what it would do. So it would expand um, and take the force of the gas balloon. Later, the gas balloons were out of cloth uh, and the smoke balloons, as I've learned from Dick Brown, 
the the they were also cloth, but the smoke particulates itself would help clog up the the cloth, the holes in the cloth, and and give you extra lifting capability. So the smoke was actually not a bad thing. It was a good thing having all those particulates there. It's of course also the case that inflating any of these balloons at that time was always a, a difficult and dangerous proposition. Uh, if the gas uh, escapes somehow, or if someone's next to the gas and you're, you're getting a full on you know tube of gas in your face, that's not a good thing. If someone lights anything near the gas, that's a bad day. Uh, and when you're holding this balloon, people have to hold the balloon for the smoke balloon to keep it erect over this fire that's going right next to it. Very easy to catch the balloon on fire. Very easy for people to feel anoxic because of this, you know, fire, fire, smoky environment. And there were people that, you know, like in the in the reports, it says, you know, there were people passing out and stuff because it was just so close to this this terribly difficult environment to launch from. So it, all of that's not without peril. And it was even just amazing they were able to pull off as many launches as they did. Yeah, well, yeah. it's still a dangerous profession, I think. Yeah, and and to, oh, today I think it's it, it's it, well, far less dangerous than it was back then. It's diff it's different now because of the the great work by New Mexicans like Sid Cutter uh, to help develop the propane burner, the the nylon balloon, um, and and uh, and you know this envelope to do it safely and also be able to control and add hot air whenever you want to. So if you want to climb, you just pull on the burner, you add more hot air. If you want to add more hot air to a smoke balloon, the only time you get to do that is at the beginning. And once you launch, you're not adding hot air again. You're going to either jump by parachute or you're going to come back down with this balloon. And there's no way to change the rate of descent. You're not taking any ballast with you other than yourself. And so in a smoke balloon, you really kind of better jump or else you're coming down with tremendous force. In uh, a gas balloon, typically they would take ballast on board during the launch. Hopefully they'd have enough lifting capability with the gas to take the person plus the ballast. And then if you're coming down too fast, you can throw ballast overboard and reduce your rate of descent. If you wanted to come down faster, you'd pull a valve and open the bag and let some gas release and come down faster. So a little bit more control on the gas balloons, but not nearly the kind of control we have today for hot air ballooning. Yeah, and, and increasing levels of skill necessary. Absolutely. So, and any other questions, anyone? I, I've asked I, several people to unmute, but I don't see them unmuting. Maybe they just don't have questions. But, but if you do, let me know. I have a question. Please, John, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I bought a copy of your book and was looking through it. And at the same time, I was uh, watching The Wizard of Oz. And I was thinking, why this guy is sort of like the carnival guy in the Wizard of Oz, and I'm exactly. wondering if he or others influence Brahms. Uh, great, great, great question, and I and I don't have the answer to that. But you're not the first to make that connection, um, and I'm really pleased you made that connection. Uh, it is the kind of the kind of thing I was hoping people would get to because it is a very similar kind of thing. I happen to know here in San Diego that uh, L. Frank Baum lived here in San Diego for some period of time. During the, during the time he was writing uh, books like The Wizard of Oz, he would live in Coronado in San Diego. And he wrote some fabulous stories about, um, that, that are about you know, cra crazy stories as he did, but pulling in parts of San Diego. So for instance, uh, if you're familiar with the Torrey Pines glider port, this glider port that they helped preserve in La Jolla, it's got a very large cliff where the gliders fly back and forth on today. But in one of his stories, I think it's in 1910, he talks about people going up to the cliff and jumping off with umbrellas and soaring over the sea and coming back and landing in, in what is La Jolla, but he doesn't mention it as by name. So he, he, and he takes parts of San Diego and, and pulls it into his stories. So very clearly, he was doing exactly what you're talking about. He was looking at the environment, what's going on, and pulling that into his stories. I just don't know if Van Tassel, in particular, was one of his uh, interests. There were people making balloon ascensions in Coronado at that time. Uh, so he would have been exposed to this kind of behavior. But again, I don't know if it was Van Tassel. Were there any uh, practical uses of balloons, that, uh, these type of balloons at the time, because I do know the military used them in the Civil War. Right. But it seems yeah. like they were just used for uh, these exhibitions. Yeah, typically, um, uh, so great question. In the military context, reconnaissance, obviously, uh, not only Civil War, but in World War I, especially, uh, in, even into World War II, people were still using balloons for, for reconnaissance. Um, and 
uh, you know, it'd be difficult to drop a bomb because you're pretty much tethered over your own territory. So that's a little difficult. Um, but again, after about 1905, uh, ballooning was generally for recreation. Um, it, it, you know, especially with the advent of powered flight and the magic of powered flight, uh, uh, that really took off, no pun intended, through 1910, 1920 into 1930 with Lindbergh's Crossing and Amelia Earhart and all that. Uh, ballooning became kind of a side uh, sideshow for for these kind of exhibitions, and the amount of people doing uh, these jumps by balloons decreased. Uh, and then, very very fortunately, again, it took uh, New Mexicans to invent and reinvent hot air ballooning as the modern version as it is today to get people to come back into ballooning in the 1960s and the early 1970s. It's unfortunate Dick's not on the call, but he was one of the first people to be involved with setting up the Fiesta and getting that going. Maybe you know Dick, uh, but great, great resource of interest in the history of ballooning and how that happened. I'll mention one last thing in that in a military context in the 1900s, the military, especially the army, became very interested in dirigibles. And Thomas Baldwin, being the dirigible expert, having won the 1904 uh, World's Fair, was hired by the Army to help bring dirigibles to the military. And the first dirigible in America's history that was military was a Baldwin dirigible. He ended up uh, also uh, getting involved with powered flight on the East Coast. And um, because of his honors in World War I, uh, mainly with dirigibles, uh, had the honor of being buried in, in Arlington National Cemetery. So he's there. He's also in the National Aviation Hall of Fame. Of course, Greef and, uh, and, and Van Tassel aren't in the Aviation Hall of Fame. They absolutely deserve to be. Montgomery is in the Aviation Hall of Fame for his efforts in gliding. He's credited as being the first to fly a controlled glider in America's history in 1884 here in San Diego. And my other previous biography that I wrote before this one was all about John Montgomery, a book called Quest for Flight. So because I had written that story about Montgomery, I had heard this connection to Van Tassel and the ballooning in the 1905 time frame. I didn't know who this Van Tassel guy was. And I was so focused on Montgomery and getting that book out that I did that project first and then got connected to Dick Brown and Rick Van Tassel. And I said, here's this whole USB stick on everything to do with Van Tassel. And that was, that was enough and got me started on the next jigsaw puzzle. So well, Gary, you've, you've taken us on a fantastic journey from uh, Albuquerque to Australia and return. So um, we much appreciate it. If, uh, if people want to get in touch with you and have questions, um, can you, do you have an, an email? Or? Absolutely. I would be honored. And again, if you have any thoughts, especially about the, the plaque and my process of how I can do that, I, I, would, I would be eager to learn from you. Uh, my, my easiest email to know is Gary Fogel, that's G-A-R-Y, F-O-G-E-L at gmail.com. Okay. It can't get much easier. We, we will make sure that gets out there. And, and that's one, one L, not two. Got it. <laughs> Other than All that, right. um, I want to thank you for your time and thank uh, you. this fascinating presentation. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, and uh, thanks for your time and, and all your and, effort. And this has been uh, recorded and it will be on the Historical Society of New Mexico website shortly. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Okay. And thank okay. you all for attending and uh, making this really a worthwhile afternoon. So we appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye now.